Um, there, yes, the recording is now on. So thank you, Chris. Um, and let's go ahead and get started here. Um, so yes, we actually have at the Douglas County Extension Office a uh, horticulture helpline. And uh, it is staffed by master gardeners Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from one to four during the growing season. So from April through the end of October. So we just finished up. Uh, and th so this is exactly what it sounds like. You can reach us, uh, the master gardeners, at uh, by phone, by walking into the office, or by email. And I'll say a little bit more about that uh, towards the end. But we offer all kinds of horticulture help. And oftentimes we also get some very interesting questions uh, through the phone about all kinds of things that sometimes aren't really related to horticulture, but people don't know who else to call. So they call the extension office. So uh, we are seeing uh, that our calls have declined uh, in the past few years because everybody's on the internet looking up solutions for themselves. And this can pro provide some valuable information, but oftentimes not so much. Uh, so what we have are people trying to sell you stuff that doesn't work. Uh, I was on a uh, one of those neighborhood listservs once, and people were talking about mold. And, oh, you would not imagine all the folk remedies um, for mold. So there's a picture of one here on this slide, these uh, solar uh, sonic pulses um, that are supposed to get rid of, apparently, mice and moles. They do not work. So there's all kinds of things advertised, but if you look at the research that has been done, uh, and not only by K-State, but by extension offices across the country, uh, what you'll find um, at the K-State website is, is stuff that will work and how you take care of mules. Um, but these sort of internet searches will, will come up with all kinds of folk remedies. Um, just looking very simply for some pest remedies you can see over on the right side of that slide, there's this thing called pest block that will apparently get rid of every pest in your home um, and in your yard. I mean, everything. So um, uh, those are really not trustworthy sources. So I'm gonna show you where to find the trustworthy sources. So you've got people trying to sell stuff. You've also got uh, stuff that's just outdated practices. So at one point in time, they were recommended um, but because research is ongoing, uh, things have changed, times have changed. So one in particular is tree wounds. A lot of people still think that if you're going to shear a limb off a tree, you need to, to somehow protect that wound and put a sealant over it. And the research has, has moved on from there and that is no longer a recommendation. It actually can promote disease. Um, in the tree. You need to let that wound heal itself. Um, it is also the reason why fall is not the best time for pruning, especially during damp weather, because that can breed some, um, some diseases. But the tree wounds, sealants are unnecessary, but yet you still find them all over the internet. Um, another one is uh, staking your tree, a newly planted tree, which is fine for one year. So that first growing season to get it stabilized, but after that, you really should remove the staking of your tree. So what you're gonna find on the internet is still some of these outdated practices if you're not looking up the latest research. Um, you also found all kinds of alternatives, um, especially if you're looking for a non-chemical non -chemical, uh, remedy for something. So homemade, all natural, uh, no chemical types of remedies for things. So here's a very popular one for weed control is mixing the vinegar, some dish soap and Epsom salts. Uh, so the problem with this is you mix this formula up and you spray it on your plant and it does look brown and dead. And so, but it only is gonna kill the top part of the weed and the roots are still gonna be there. And uh, that weed is generally probably going to grow back once it, it recovers a bit, depending on what time you sprayed it. Uh, and so it, it is usually homemade vinegar. There is a horticultural vinegar that um, can be used at times, but most of what you're going to find on the internet is this homemade version. Um, and the other thing that you're going to do with this mixture is maybe not thoroughly kill the weed you want to by the so-called natural means, but you're also going to harm the other plants. Um, so the dish soap and Epsom salts 
can damage um, not only so soil microorganisms, but also um, other plants in the vicinity. If they build up, if you've got um, too much Epsom salt on there, um, you're going to harm uh, your next door, the next door plants to the weed uh, that you don't want to kill. So the first step in preventing problems is always, well, the preventing of the problem and good gardening practice. That's what you want to start with before you start getting into rabbit holes of trying to figure out how to deal with your problem. What is going to prevent many, many, many problems in your garden and landscape is number one, plant selection. Right plant, right place. As we always say, that is going to be half, you know, more than halfway there. Uh, to preventing problems. So make sure you've got the right plant in the right place. Sun loving plants in the sunny spots and shade tolerant plants in the shady spots. Uh, good garden hygiene and sanitation, very, very important, especially uh, for soil borne um, pests and diseases. So after the growing season is over, I know many of you have heard not to clean up your garden um, as much in the fall. And that's that's fine for your perennial and your flower beds. But when you're talking vegetable gardening, um, if you have any diseases in that vegetable garden, you definitely want to get rid of all that plant litter um, that is there. If your tomatoes have had septoria leaf spot and you leave them in the garden, um, you're, that's just going to perpetuate the situation. Uh, so good garden hygiene. You have powdery mildew on your peonies. Make sure you throw away that plant matter at the end of the year. So clean up um, your gardens from diseased uh, parts of tissue and definitely your vegetable garden. Make sure you clean that up. Um, mechanical removal of pests. You don't always have to, to um, spray anything. You can take care of a lot of things just mechanically. And this is you know, our favorite phrase is a bucket of soapy water. Find a bucket of soapy water and you can take care of many, many insects, the tomato hornworms, the bagworms. Now, admittedly, a lot of these can get out of hand and that's when you call us or you do the research I'm gonna show you how to do um, for more intensive control. But a lot of things can be dealt with um, by mechanical removal of the pests. Um, there are natural controls out there, beneficial insects. We don't really recommend purchasing beneficial insects for your garden because they just tend to fly away um, and, and move on. But we do recommend planting so that you can attract beneficial, beneficial insects to your garden. So these are just some brief tips up hand before we get into uh, more of the details. Um, there's also waiting it out um, in some instances. Uh, you know, some of our, our weeds are, are annuals and they will pass. Um, and you might tolerate that little bit of imperfection in your yard for a while before resorting to more um, intensive measures to get rid of it. Um, sometimes we just need to tolerate a little bit of munching on our plants, um, especially for the pollinator plants that we're planting. A lot of times we want those plants to be eaten by the caterpillars. Uh, that's what they're there for if you're trying to support pollinators. So tolerating a little bit of imperfection can go a long way. So that being said, uh, prevention and good gardening practice will get you a long way to preventing problems, um, but we're gonna go and look where you can find um, more detailed information about your individual issues in your landscape. So we're gonna start out with lawns. And so most lawn issues, weeds and pests, will be tolerable or handled by having a thick, healthy lawn. So what you wanna do is you wanna to try to get to that point where you have a thick, healthy lawn where you really don't have to worry so much about weed control. So what I'm gonna show you, what we have here at the Extension Office and online is a fabulous publication called Tall Fescue Lawn. And it has basically a year's worth of information on how to create and maintain a thick, healthy lawn. And I'm gonna show you that publication here. So um, you should be seeing tall fescue lawn on your screens. Chris, is that, can I get a thumbs up with that? Okay, uh, so I'll increase this a little bit. So this is our publication on tall fescue lawn. So it basically takes you through a year of caring for your lawn. Uh, mowing, fertilizing, planting, watering, 
uh, when you're doing overseeding, if you're creating a new lawn, uh, here's all the stuff that you do to reach that tall, thick, healthy lawn. Here's the seeding schedule. We have uh, recommendations for overseeding, recommendations for watering, recommendations for fertilizing. Here's the general fertilizing schedule. Those of you who are looking to, for your lawn to green up early in the spring are going to be fertilizing this month. And there's the, there's the recommendation there. Mowing heights, um, how to mow, when to thatch, when to aerate. So these are all the, basically in about, what is it, about three pages or so, gives you the guidelines for managing your lawn in order to get a thick, and that's gonna go a long way for weed So you don't have to spend so much, if you have a thick, healthy lawn, you're not gonna to have to spend that much, many time, resources, and chemicals on your lawn. So of course though, uh, one of the things that's important to do right away when you're um, looking at problems in your landscape, or even without problems, you should actually do a soil test. Um, this is particularly important while most of the people coming in for soil tests are, there's got something wrong with their lawn or they want to maintain the lawn's health. Um, and in order to know how much fertilizer you need to apply, you really should start with a soil test. And I'm going to show you uh, a little bit later. Let's see, I can see if I have this one up. Soil testing. Yes. So here is on our website. Uh, the lawn and garden soil test. And it's a description of how you go about getting a soil sample to bring to the extension office. So it'll give you detailed information. And the most important thing here is you're going to be sampling soil and bringing in soil samples from each individual uh, area of your yard. So if you want to know about fertilizing for your lawn, you're going to get a soil sample from your lawn. If you want to know about fertilizing and the pH of your soil for your vegetable garden, you're going to get a soil sample from your vegetable garden. Um, so those individual areas of your yard and landscape, you'll be getting soil samples. And this uh, document on our website will specify how it is you go about doing that. And the rest is simple. You bring that into the office. Um, Someone at the office helps you fill out the form. It goes off to K-State Lab, and then you get a printout of your what your soil, soil uh, levels are, your nutrient levels, and your pH, depending on which soil test you get. And it will have recommendations for you. So that is a great way to start on a healthy landscape, is to do that. Now, so, if you're not starting with a thick, healthy yard um, and you're trying to get there, um, so what if you do have an undesirable quantity of weeds in your lawn? Well, we have a publication for that. Uh, weed control in your home lawn. And it, once again, starts with good management. Um, that's how you prevent a lot of problems, but also describes um, in detail which chemicals to use when and on what. So um, I'm not going to bring this up. It's a, it's, it's not a really long document, but it does detail what you should do because there's a difference in dealing with broadleaf annual weeds, grassy weeds, broadleaf perennial weeds. And this document is going to detail what you do and when you do it. Uh, but first thing you have to know is how, I mean, what is it you have? You've got weeds in your lawn, you're not sure what they have. There is a website on K-State that will has, has picture di pictures of the most common lawn weeds uh, that we find here in North, in Kansas. And so there's a picture, a little bit of picture guide right there and that'll link you to um, control for those specific needs. I'm gonna show you something on the website that's really handy to use. Uh, so we often get uh, pictures and calls into the office. My lawn looks terrible. What could be the problem? And it's really undefined. It's just sort of brown spots everywhere. So I'm going to show you this particular part of the website, the turf diagnostic link. Um, like I said, remember, I'm going to post all these so that you can go to them live. But this is our turf diagnostic guide on the K-State website. And it's actually a question and answer 
So you can go through this and say, when, when is it you're seeing the first problems in your lawn? It says right here, problems appearing in winter to very early spring. So that's what's coming up. And it gives you some a description of what you might be seeing. So you've bleached your dead grass. What does that look like really? Winter desiccation. And it'll actually give you a picture of that problem. Okay, and take, so here's, uh, so we've got irregular patterns or streaks, or maybe you have circular patterns. Um, maybe they're irregular and you don't know what they are. So you're gonna look, here's a, here's a picture of powdery mildew. So you go through this question and answer and it's really handy um, to kind of give you a start on what might be wrong with your lawn. And you may be able to self-diagnose a bit if you've got something that's fairly obvious um, with this diagnostic tool here. And of course, as always, you can always send pictures and, or walk a sample into the extension office for us to confirm um, what might be wrong with your lawn. But this is a really handy thing. It's also a little bit intimidating to realize what could go wrong. Um, that's, that's a problem with a lot of these things as you look at it, I didn't even know there could be this many things that would go wrong with my lawn. So it's a very educational, a uh, thing to use, and it goes through the whole year um, of what might appear as you go through a year of lawn care. So that's a handy thing um, to use. And we also have more information that you ever thought you'd want to know about your lawn. We have lots and lots of individual publications, so I'm not going to bring each one of those up, but there will be a link on the uh, file that I put on our website. So lots of lawns and turf publications, pests, diseases, lawn care. And we also have lots and lots of information on other sorts of lawns. Most of the lawns we have here in Northeast Kansas are, are, excuse me, are tall fescue lawns, but we do have information on other turfs like um, uh, the zoysia grass or buffalo grass, um, information even on Bermuda grass, so that some people grow uh, further south. So we do, and we do have turf recommendations. So turf cultivars, cultivars of various tall fescue lawn uh, grasses. Um, we have recommendations for that as well. So you can find that all on that link. So let's turn to trees and shrubs now. So what I'm going to tell you is basically how to avoid problems in the first place. I have to say that trees and shrubs are problems with trees and shrubs. A recommendation for trees and shrubs. Uh, these are probably the question we get about what the types of questions we get most commonly at the hotline um, are about trees and shrubs. So uh, first of all, to avoid problems is choosing the right tree or shrub for the right place. And we've got a number of publications that recommend um, trees and shrubs for this part of Kansas. So preferred trees for Northeast Kansas is what I'm going to show you. But we also have some brand new, we have a brand new publication called Conifer Trees for Kansas. Conifers are very difficult unless you're going with the, the native red cedar. Conifers are really difficult to grow in Kansas, um, but we have some recommendations. Um, one of the things that K-State has is a research station um, down outside of Wichita called the John Kerr Research Center. And that's where they do um, the uh, person who runs that John Pear Research Center calls it, it's his torture chamber um, for Kansas vegetation. And they basically run the trees and shrubs through, you know, can they grow, can they take it um, growing in Kansas? Um, we have extremes. They, they say if you can grow in Kansas, you can grow it anywhere because we have the extremes um, on the continent. We've got cold winters and really, really hot summers. Um, so this research station finds the types of trees and shrubs that can take that. So we've got our preferred trees for Kansas here. We've got conifer trees, and then we've got deciduous and evergreen shrubs. And I'm going to show you just quickly here our preferred trees of Northeast Kansas. So a simple publication on um, talks, it gives you some background information on how to choose, you know, sort of evaluate your site before you choose your tree. Um, and then it, it's organized by height, and it'll give you whether that particular tree 
um, can handle sun and shade, our high alkaline soils. We have high alkaline soils, high pH here in Northeast Kansas. Um, drought, uh, wet soil, it gives you some features of the tree, whether it's good for fall or spring flowers. And so it's an excellent publication. There is, I think there's still one plant on here, one tree on here. Um, no, maybe they, maybe it's off here. There was a, no, there was one tree on here. I thought I was going to just tell you not, I wouldn't recommend anyway, but I think that they have removed that tree. So, so you can go through small, medium, large trees, and it'll give you the features and what it will tolerate, it's environmental tolerances. So it's an excellent publication um, for starting out with your tree in your landscape. So that'll go most of the way uh, in preventing problems. Next step though, is you select the right tree for the right place. So evaluating your site, make sure you're putting, uh, a, a, if you need a, an understory tree, shady tree, make sure you're choosing the right um, plant, the right tree for that versus a sunny spot. Uh, what kind of soil you have, do a soil test. Um, once you select your tree, uh, you're gonna have to plant it properly. And that is absolutely critical, is planting that tree. The problem is what, what oftentimes we see problems with trees and that tree has been in the ground for 10 years, but yet there was an initial problem with the planting. And now the tree is dying. And it was something that happened years ago when it was planted. And there's something called, it's a tree death spiral that you do something wrong with the planting. There's a, a root that's girdled, girdled the plant and you might not know that for several years. Um, and just a number of things start happening. The tree gets weak and then it gets a disease or it gets a pest infestation, but it all started back because the tree was weakened or suffering from some kind of stress. So it's very important to correctly plant a tree. And of course, we have um, a document for that, a, a publication for that, selecting and planting a tree. And we have a video um, on our uh, K State website to show you how to do that properly. And then you, of course, need to water it. And we have, we have information on that as well watering a new tree and then watering established trees and shrubs. Um, if we have a really dry winter, uh, most people ignore. Uh, their landscape, watering their landscape over winter. If we go through a really dry period um, this winter, you will want to water your trees and shrubs. So, um, so there's information on how to do that. Okay, so but you've got existing trees um, that have problems now. You just moved into a house, um, you planted your tree years ago, but something's going wrong. So how how do how do I research that? What's going on? So the first step, of course, is you have to figure out what kind of tree it is. Um, you have to identify your tree, uh, and that it goes a long way in diagnosing the problem. So what I've got here and what you will be able to access uh, when I put this on the website are several online interactive tree guides. Now, of course, there's lots of uh, books on tree guides, um, but I put these up here because they're um, interactive with links. Um, the one we use um, a lot for training in terms of tree identification is Arbor Day Foundation, but the Iowa State also has one, and Virginia Tech Dendrology is excellent, not so much as a key, but um, in describing features of trees. So uh, take a look at that and identify a tree. You can always bring a sample into the office or send pictures. Now, when you bring a sample into the office for identification and diagnosis, we do need a bit of a branch with several leaves on it and a picture of the whole tree um, helps us with identification and diagnosing problems. So that's one thing when you bring something into the office, um, you might wanna call first and ask what, what kind of sample you would need to bring in um, for us to be able to properly identify and diagnose a problem with your tree or shrub. So it always helps to give a call first. I'll give the number at the end um, to ask what kind of sample we might need. Let's see. So you've got this tree, you've identified what it is or had somebody identify what it is, 
and now you've got a problem. So there's all kinds of things. We get spots on leaves, yellowing leaves. We get dead, dead things, already dead. What caused it um, coming into the office? So there's this excellent guide here. Uh, tree and shrub problems in Kansas. And this is one of my favorite, favorite things uh, to use when we get problems in at the office uh, because it is, it's something you can download from the K-State website. It's a, it's a one of our larger brochures, but you can download it. And it will go, take you through um, general environmental stresses, um, sort of general description of very common diseases and problems with trees and shrubs. So that first part of the guide is really valuable in understanding what's going on in your landscape. Uh, so, and then you've got, and it has lots of pictures as well. So we've got, because a lot of times you can read a description, but until you see it, um, it's very difficult to diagnose. So there's lots of pictures in this guide to help find out what might be wrong with your tree or shrub. Lots of pictures. And then further on in this, I'll show you, you can go to a particular tree or shrub you have and then look up what the symptoms are that you're looking at. You've got your your piece of branch or your piece of the shrub in your hand. And you can look through this and look at the pictures, look for the various symptoms, and then read what some of the, what you should do about it, essentially. You know, is, should you be doing anything about it? Or is there something you can spray? Um, is it something that's just gonna pass? A lot of times we get calls about these growths on leaves, particularly on oak trees and hackberries. There are these, balls or growths on the leaves. And oftentimes what that is, is just a gall. It's just a plant response um, to an insect that is in that um, leaf, that has buried its way into the leaf. And it's just a cosmetic problem and it doesn't mean anything's wrong with the tree at all. So um, you would figure that, you would find that information in this guide. Um, and the, the next step, of course, is once you take a look at this and you think, well, I think I have this, then you might want to bring it into the office um, for confirmation. Um, if it's not, if you're not too sure, because um, we've seen a lot of these, so we know we can recognize um, what is wrong with the tree. And we also use this um, quite a lot. And the other thing we have um, to the advantage is if we can't figure out what is going on wrong with your tree or shrub, we have the K-State Plant Pathology Lab. We can always send a sample in um, to the Plant Pathology Lab and they will figure out what it is and give us recommendations to give to you uh, for handling whatever disease you might have. So excellent publication. Highly recommend taking a look at that. For tree and shrub problems in Kansas. And then if there's nothing that can be done, <laughs> Sometimes there is nothing that can be done. If you've got emerald ash borer, um, for example, um, we do have a list of certified arborists that we that you can look up or we can give you um, the Kansas Association of Arborists, certified commercial arborists. These are the people you want because we can't, we can't make site visits. We can't come out to your home and diagnose your tree. You need a certified arborist to do that. Um, so oftentimes we will get this list. If we can't come out, uh, they can confirm uh, what might be a problem with your tree and then recommend, can they treat it? Do they have to prune your tree? Do they have to do, do they have to cut it down? Um, so they'd be able to evaluate that for you. So we do have a list of certified arborists. It's updated fairly regularly. So I think every year this list is uh, updated and it's a list by town, by, by city. So you can look up the closest certified arborist. And you can always ask if you have a favorite tree service you use for trimming, you can always ask if they have a certified arborist on staff if you want somebody to help diagnose a problem with your tree. Okay, so let's turn to vegetables. Uh, what to plant, when to plant, how to care for. We have the ultimate Kansas garden guide. Uh, this is something that is available online. You can look up or you can come and buy it at the extension office for $6. And I'll show you what 
that garden guide is. So, oh, this thing that you see on the screen is at the, the back of the garden guide. It's my favorite part of the garden guide. The garden guide gives you all kinds of tips on, on what to plant, tips for various individual vegetables, composting, the works. But my favorite part is at the end, and I always print this out and tack it up on my wall um, every year, is this planting guide, planting and harvesting guide. It's just a real simple thing to look at for um, some of our more common vegetable vegetables, when to plant them and when to harvest them. And this helps with um, what we call succession planting, where you can say, okay, I know in April, and then if I'm gonna pull out my beets in July, I can plant them again um, for a fall garden or trying to figure out, well, okay, I'm gonna pull up my, uh, let's see, I'm gonna pull up my onion. What else can I plant after I put my onion sets in? I got my green onions there. Oh, look, now I can plant my potatoes after I pull up my onions. So this is a very, very helpful guide right here. Uh, so, but the front of this material, so this is in the back of that brochure, but as you can see, uh, it gives you a little bit of advice on everything. Extending your season with low tunnels. It actually goes through, let me see, yes, individual vegetables. Talks about how, how to space them, how to care for them, where are the common diseases and problems you'll find with growing a particular vegetable. It's a very, very handy guide. So if you're a beginning gardener, um, even if you're an advanced gardener, there's something um, for you in this. But particularly for those new gardeners out there, um, this is a handy thing to have around, um, especially that back, back page there. Um, so go ahead, if you're thinking about giving gardening a try, vegetable gardening a try, um, go ahead and download this or um, come into the office and um, pick up a copy. We also have um, various brochures and lists. So we have recommended vegetable varieties, um, hybrids and non-hybrids that have been tested here in Kansas and um, are what's labeled for various resistance to particular diseases. Um, so you can print that out, that vegetable variety recommendation and take that to your favorite garden center and say, do you have this, this, and this? Um, so and these are things that have been tested in Kansas. Every year there are vegetable trials in Kansas and they come up with our recommended variety. So that's a handy thing to print out, take to your garden center. We have loads and loads of brochures on individual vegetables. So we've got it in the Kansas Garden Guide, but we also have just individual sheets and individual pages of information on growing particular vegetables. And that this will link to that. Um, and then we also have um, a particular publications on lengthier publications uh, for particular vegetables like tomatoes. Everybody likes to grow tomatoes. Tomatoes always have problems, many problems. So we have a dedicated updated brochure on tomato leaf and fruit diseases and disorders. Very handy publication to have around if you're trying to grow tomatoes. Okay, let's see. I don't think I had anything else on there. So let's turn to our perennials now. What do we have for perennials? Once again, you're more than halfway there. If you're gonna have the right plant in the right place, you're gonna have fewer problems. So uh, how to find what to plant. We have, a, there's a new website um, out of Pace State, it's called Kansas Roots. And it's, uh, uh, you can search for particular plants on it. You can get recommendations for particular plants that grow well in Kansas. I was having a little bit of difficulty with it this morning when I was bringing the page up um, for some of the categories. So I, I, uh, I'm going to have. I'm going to leave this up here, so you're going to be able to click on it when you get uh, this program's file, so you can go explore with it. But what I'm going to show you is the Missouri Botanical Garden Plant Finder. So the Kansas Roots and the Missouri Plant Finder are very similar in the fact that they have these search engines for plant recommendations. Um, but the, the the Kansas Roots one was a little glitchy this morning. But I do. It's brand new, so I, I highly recommend you go and try it but I'll show you what I'm talking about with a plant finder. So this is the Missouri Botanical Garden Plant Finder. 
So you're, you've got a new landscape or you're looking to re rejuvenate um, your perennial garden or your annuals, um, and you wanna know what's best for your landscape. So one of the things you can do is if you have a, if you have a particular plant in mind, you can go ahead and type that in. You can do this on the Kansas roots as well. Um, and, or you can just sort of search for things um, that you want. And you type in various different, um, so you want a perennial, a gracious perennial. We are zone six. You want something for part shade, we got a lot of shade. Let's see. And here's the problem. You know I me, mean? I don't like to water that much. So you want dry, part shade. And I can tell you from personal experience, if you put in full shade, dry, herbaceous perennial, it's not going to come up with much. <laughs> but um, most of the things you do, you do have to give it a little care to. So um, let's just say, let's say you want herbaceous perennial, part shade, dry, and you want it to be a, let's see, where's ground cover? That's very common. We get lots of calls in because grass won't grow under trees. Um, so we often recommend various ground covers. And just a tip, if you're trying to go grass under a tree, yes, it, it, is, it is problematic. It's not just the shade that is the problem with the grass. It's the fact that the tree is taking up the water in the landscape. So it's very difficult to grow grass under a tree. Um, so we often recommend trying to grow something else instead of beating your head against the dry soil. So let's see what this comes up with. So you go ahead and you get your search. Whoops, see, yep. Yeah. I didn't, I got to add a little bit of moisture if I really want to do this. So I'll try that and see what happens. Whoops. Okay. I knew I was going to mess up at one point in time with this whole going back and forth. Let's, let's try some part shade and let's try some adding a little bit of water. And there we go. Then we've come up with four recommendations for a ground herbaceous perennial ground cover for this part of Kansas, part shade, not so much water. So here's a few recommendations. And Kansas roots will do this as well. I just had a problem with the perennial pitch this morning. Um, so try Kansas Roots, try Missouri Botanical Garden for exploring what might work in your landscape. And, and as you can see with this, you can get, you can choose for uh, all different kinds of features. So your leaves that are um, colorful, wildlife. Um, so take a look at that and find some plant recommendations. You can always call the office. We love giving out plant recommendations. It's a, one of the fun things I like to do is help people pick plants for their landscape. So Johnson County um, Extension also has some perennial plant lists um, and fact sheets on perennials. You can print those out, get that perennial plant list, download that, print that, take that to your local garden center, um, see what they have. It's an excellent plant list. Um, and the other thing I wanna show you here is if you're um, interested in planting natives, which is becoming more and more popular these days. We do have a dedicated um, website uh, now for um, planting natives in Northeast Kansas. This is a relatively new thing. It's a kind of a working document, um, but what we have here are guides for not only gardening with native plants, but also um, reconstructing prairie, prairie restoration, um, larger landscapes with natives, and you have cropland borders, um, establishing natives in the cropland borders. I'll go ahead and do the gardening with natives. So here's the guide. You can download the whole guide. It's kind of a how-to guide for gardening with natives. Um, but we also have recommended species. So it's another species list you can download. Um, and oops, no, that's not gonna work on me. I forgot, I was getting a little ahead of myself. Um, if I, you won't be able to see this. So I'm not going to go ahead and click on it, but we have a recommended species list. We also have a list of uh, regional and local providers of seeds and plants. And it's listed by locale. Um, and it's also listed whether they sell plants or seeds and the contact information. So this is something that's going to be hopefully continually updated. Um, each year as we get more and more vendors or vendors change. But this is an excellent thing. Where to find, it's just a simple spreadsheet of where to find native plants and seeds.
Um, and then another thing we have on, and this is the same for each of these units, we have reconstructing prairie, prairie restoration. Um, we have a number of services that also you can um, talk to about planting natives if you're talking about larger acreages. So where to see native plants in public gardens? There's a list of places. So you can kind of take a look at what this looks like, what you might like. Um, you could always come to our um, Master Gardener Demonstration Gardens, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So, okay, so we've got gardening with natives. Ah, yes, there they are, the Douglas County Demonstration Gardens. Do come visit us. We have demonstration gardens right here at the Extension Office. That's where I am right now. We've got extensive gardens around the office. We have um, a demonstration garden in Eudora at the CPA Park. We have the Tom Swan Demonstration Garden down in Baldwin City. Uh, we have Monarch Wash, Monarch Station number one out on KU's West Campus. And we also have um, a, a demonstration garden at the Native and Medicinal Garden um, just north of Lawrence near the Prairie Moon um, School. So those are our demonstration gardens. We also have an arboretum on the extension grounds. Um, that every year we're putting more labels out, but a lot of our plants are labeled. So you can wander around our garden and say, oh, hey, I like that. Um, and, and look at the label and see what it is. If it's not labeled, you can always take a picture of it, walk into the office and, 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 and ask the master gardener show sure, here or myself, and we will try to help you figure out what that plant is. So come visit our demonstration gardens and see what grows here. The, one, the picture on the bottom left there is our shade garden at the extension. A um, lot of things are labeled as you can see here. Um, so come take a look, see what might grow in your yard. Okay, um, moving a little bit away from plants because we often get a lot of calls about pests. Um, people don't know what to do with the thing crawling around in their house, so they call the extension office. Um, so, uh, oh, and actually here's one more. So we have a alphabetical list of common plant problems in Kansas, but we also have uh, resources for these pests. But let me show you real quick this list here, plant and pest problems. So this is our alphabetical list. You have to, to use this, you kind of have to know what you've got. But if you do know what you've got, these are plant and pest problems. So each one of these alphabetical lists, um, and you can look up the brochure on what to do about it. Um, but at this point, for to use this list, it's best to know what you've got. And if you don't know what you've got, we've got um, a pest of the week link, and we've got a new publication on household pests. So if you've got something crawling around your house, definitely look this up and it'll describe, um, it has some pictures and um, we'll tell you what to do. We also have a number of sheets for nuisance wildlife. Um, no, there really isn't anything you can do about squirrels. I'll just say that up front. Um, there's just not a whole lot that can be done, but we do have a publication on tree squirrels. We do have publications on moles and um, voles and rabbits and all kinds of critters. So um, you can take a look at those as well. And then uh, finally, we have some just general informational links. Um, so our Douglas County Lawn and Garden website um, is sort of a hub where you can get to a lot of these materials. Uh, let's see, it's uh, Douglas County Lawn and Garden. There we go. Douglas County Lawn and Garden where you can go to a bunch of educational videos. These garden hour videos are excellent. Um, one hour um, on all kinds of topics. And we've got the state experts um, giving these presentations on this video. They're absolutely excellent. Uh, so I highly recommend those. Um, the Horticulture Information Center, just a, a, a hub of all kinds of horticulture information. So this lawn and garden website is really valuable, gets you to a lot of places. And the Horticulture Newsletter. So the horticulture newsletter is something you can sign up for in your email. So there's the information center and our horticulture newsletter that you can sign up for. There's the subscription right there on the blog version of the newsletter. And it comes out every week and basically has seasonal information. What pests are happening out there in Kansas, what you should be doing with your garden um, at this point in the year, educational videos, uh, 
and uh, you can actually go on to the sidebar here and take a look what you know what you should be watching for what you should be doing in September or by topic you can look here what to do about blossom and rot called get every year about tomatoes blossom and rot so this is a it, it's a it's a great thing to find in your email box every week if you are looking to whether you're container gardening backyard gardening landscaping whatever you're doing this newsletter is excellent, filled with all kinds of information. And it's just handy to have it right there in your inbox every week. So I would definitely recommend subscribing to that. So that was the sort of tour of the K-State resources, which is a lot. And one reason I did this program um, is to show you, because it's very difficult to find this information on your own. If you just looked up K-State horticulture, it would take you have to spend some time with the, the website to find all this information. So I've tried to link to the key pieces of information for you um, so you can get to them. If you cannot find it on the K-State website and we don't have everything, um, here's a way to search the internet responsibly. Responsibly searching the internet so you don't get um, made up stuff. Uh, so you can, when you have a problem that you're worried about, brown leaves on, on your tree or something, you if you just do one of these two things, in your search term that you put in there, add extend the word extension or add .edu to your search term, you're gonna get research-based information by using that. So what's gonna come up is, it, it, is if K-State doesn't have it, maybe you can look up, uh, the information will come from Clemson or Purdue or Cornell or Iowa State or um, Missouri, some other extension office, okay? And then, then at least you know it's research-based information that you're getting. Um, another thing we have is the, the extension uh, foundation. So you can, there's actually uh, an ask extension, which is sort of a nationwide hotline. You can always go to that as a ask extension. They may have changed that term recently, but it's sort of a nationwide uh, hub that you can do for extension. Um, but try typing in extension or .edu on your search term. And at least then you can, if, you've got, if you end up with an extension office and their information, you're gonna find good quality information um, on whatever it is you're worried about in the landscape. Also, more pieces of information, you can come to our garden show, March 12th. We're gonna to have tons of educational booths and on all kinds of topics. And so you can wander around um, and talk to master gardeners about your gardening um, issues. Whether you, like I said, whether you're container gardening, uh, whether you're just getting started, uh, whether you want, um, uh, we actually have a booth called Yoga in the Garden. So, you know, you want some information about how to stay fit in your garden. Uh, we've got good bug, bad bug uh, tables. We've got tables on composting. We've got loads of information. Um, and an amazing gardening garage sale, I might say, if you're looking for you, starting to get your garden, garden shoes on uh, for the spring. So come to our March 12th garden show. Loads of information uh, there. Uh, you can pick up all kinds of general resources. Talk to master gardeners about your particular interests and then go home with some pretty cool used gardening things. We also, all throughout the year, have gardening uh, workshops and lectures. Um, we have this monthly program. Uh, we also have a speakers bureau uh, with loads of topics. We have a YouTube channel now, lots of educational videos. Um, you can find out about our programming through Facebook or on our website. So these links will be available to you. Um, when I post this program, and you will find out what our, our what the lineup is for next year. So come to one of our talks or programs. And then finally, um, here's how you get a hold of us. So here's the phone number for the Douglas County Extension. Um, our address, if you want to walk in um, and talk to us, um, bring us a sample of something that's going wrong in your landscape. And you can always email us. Um, this is actually a great way to uh, get uh, information um, without having to come to the extension office. You can often send us pictures, uh, try to make them clear, you know, 
take a picture. If you have a problem, tree problem, make sure you take a picture of the whole tree. Make sure you take a picture of the, the leaf or branch that's problematic. Um, we can often do a lot um, by email. So if we can't, we'll, we'll tell you um, if you need to bring something in or we need to talk to you more. But um, we've got um, either myself or the Master Gardener standing by um, to help you. Now the garden hotline itself isn't open, uh, is open April through October, the growing season. Um, but you can always call extension office if you've got um, a problem outside those time periods um, or send us an email with your particular issue. So we hope to hear from you. We hope to see you at our garden show or at one of our programs. And like I said, I will be posting this on our website. So you can go to all these links and this is a great time. It's winter. You have, now you have your winter readings. So here's how you go through this. And so you'll be all prepared um, for the spring growing season. So thank you. And Chris, do we have any particular Questions. Thank you. Uh, there was one which had one response, but I'll read it in case you want to say anything else. Um, I planted new tall fescue seeds in early September in a large area, and I'm now trying to vacuum shred leaves on it. Next spring, can I plant more seeds in bare spots or hope grass seedlings will fill in naturally? And the one response to that said, well, you might do that during the winter if you're adding more seeds, just because spring is not so recommended, but you might have more to say. Yes, um, you can do dormant seeding of grass seed. So you can put it down, I would put it down maybe a little later in the season. Um, and so that's that when over the winter, there'll be some um, thawing and freezing. And so the grass might uh, sprout come spring, but you can also, if you've just got bare spots, you can also throw some seed down in the spring. The reason we don't recommend spring planting of grass seed is uh, just the competition with the weeds um, is a little intense for those new, new grass uh, seedlings. So you, you could try either, you could try either the dormant seeding or you could do some spring seeding as well for those bare spots. You're gonna be careful about what you're adding in the spring. A lot of people add what's called sort of weed and feed fertilizers and herbicides. And so you have to be very careful and read the label on those because a lot of those things you cannot put on if you have new grass growing or new seed. So you have to be very careful about the timing of putting those kinds of products on your new grass in the spring. So make sure you read the label. And I don't think, hold on, I'm just going back down through. I think that's it for what's in chat. Okay. Are there live questions for Sharon? I know like, I am really grateful that you'll have this copy to us so we can, yes. can get links. I mean, when we're working on the hotline, we have a lot of stuff in front of us, but we don't always have all the links we want at home for. Yeah. And yes, so this will be posted on our website uh, next week in a form where you can um, basically hotlink to these links. Um, and like I said, um, this is a winter's worth of reading. <laughs> So if you're looking for something to do over winter, you can explore the K-State website and other extension websites. Other questions? Somebody asked if you can email the EMGs when that when it goes live, the Master Gardeners when it goes live. Yes, I can do that. I will, I will make an announcement um, not only to uh, our uh, Master Gardener listserv, but I'll also post it on Facebook um, with a link with a link to this program. Ellen, there's I one other. I have a question. Oh, excuse me. Go ahead. Go, go, go. I had a question with kind of a commentary along with it. Um, one of the things you pointed out, Sharon, in the vegetable garden and cleaning that out and getting rid of some of that um, material that could carry disease and things like that. A lot of the questions that I get asked, um, we all get questions asked by friends. Oh, you're a master gardener. You'll know. Um, but one of the easiest ways to sort them out 
is I try to figure out if they're talking about a native or a non-native plant. You know, in the vegetable garden, it is important to clean a lot of that stuff out because most of our vegetable gardens are not native. But in the native gardens that I have, a lot of them I do leave natural because that's where um, insects and different critters like to dwell, lay their eggs and things like that. So I don't clean out certain areas of the garden and other areas I do. And one of the key things in sorting out answers to questions is finding out if they're asking about a native plant or a non-native plant because it's it can be a completely different answer. And um, I appreciated what you said there about in the vegetable garden about cleaning that out because it can carry over those diseases to the next year. But I intentionally don't do that in other types, in other areas of my garden that are a completely different um, culture. So, you know, when we try to figure out answers for people, try to figure out what it is that they're growing. Is it, nat is it native or is it non-native? And it, it just, it's a co completely different concept for a lot of people. They don't know the difference. And so that's, that's part of our education in figuring yeah. that out, figuring out how to answer their question. <laughs> nice. Sharon, there are a couple more also in the hotline now. What is the newsletter's name and how do I sign up? I know you pointed to the part on the site, but. Yes, but. Um, it's the, just the, the K-State Horticultural Newsletter. Uh, and there will be a link when, when this goes up on the website. But just if you just type in um, Horticultural Newsletter K-State, um, then it, it should come up. Uh, in your Google search, and if you go to the blog version, so there's a there's like a PDF, a document version of it, um, but you want the sort of web-based blog version, and on the, the right-hand side there will be a subscribe, and you just type your email into that. But like I said, I will have the link um, if you can't find it. And then or, or somebody, I might be able to... Um, might be able to put that in the chat or maybe somebody, oh, it's a good, thank you, Thelma. Thelma put it in the chat, the link to the horticulture newsletter. Yes. Yeah, I'm usually the one putting stuff in the chat, so I can't. I know. <laughs> so thank you, Thelma. And then there's a question, do whether we have a lot of horticulture books that she you introduced in our library, and I'm assuming it means the library at the extension office. That question's probably from a new master gardener. Yes, um, so the master gardeners have a library for themselves to do research that you're welcome to check. The public is welcome to come in and look at the books, um, but we don't check them out um, for the public because they're our, our, our resource library for helping, helping the public um, answer gardening questions. Um, but certainly, uh, we do have a library for the public to come look at and peruse and see what they might want it to uh, get. And also for the master gardeners themselves, you can check those books out. Um, and we've got, I mean, our, one of our master gardeners, Susie, Susie Nightingale, has um, organized it all, Dewey Decimal yes. System. So it's ready to go for you to check out books for winter reading. Super. And now another one has come in uh, from Julie DeYoung. How can you improve soil in established perennial beds and lawn? I have clay soils and want to improve it, but I'm not sure how when there are plants in the ground. Yes, clay soil. We are all dealing with a lot of that, except for a few lucky ones in North Florence, which um, and have better soil, but basically to improve clay soils is for add organic matter, add, 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 add organic matter. And you can do that around existing plants. Um, so you can always incorporate compost and in organic matter in an existing perennial bed. Um, so you can, if you've got it all mulched now, you don't want to incorporate, like you'd be a wood chip mulch in your perennial bed. You don't want to incorporate that mulch into the soil because um, that'll strip some nitrogen um, from the soil. So just move that back and go ahead and add some organic matter, compost manure, whatever you've got, um, and just do that every year. And then you can cover it back over with the mulch. Uh, you can also try using green, green mulch, as they call it, green, you know, by interplanting, making a very dense planting and putting a ground cover in between um, your taller perennial plants 
and that will help improve the soil as well. Um, if instead of all mulch, you actually try to do a little more interplanting there. Uh, use different, different heights of plants that will improve your soil. Um, as far as the lawn goes, you can add thin layers of organic matter um, over your soil um, that, that will incorporate over time. So if you've got an existing lawn and you want to get some organic matter, then you can put a thin layer um, of organic matter compost, um, like that cotton broke compost. So that washes off really quick, so you don't want to do that anytime near rain, but that will eventually incorporate um, organic matter, especially if you're going to go through and you're going to aerate your soil, you can incorporate some organic matter that way. Um, but organic matter is the, the, the key to that, is continual adding of organic matter into your soil to improve those conditions. Thank you. I don't see other questions in our chat. Are there other live questions? If not, I want to thank Sharon very, very much because not only did she do a great presentation, but when the plans were changed for November, she moved her presentation up a couple months for us. And so I really appreciate that because that ability to find answers to our questions is helpful to us all. Okay, I have a question to okay. Sharon. Go, go for it. I typed it to her, but I guess it didn't go through. Um, I have six over 15 feet high ash trees lining our drive, and I have treated them for a number of years systemically for the emerald ash borer. This year I have one in a line of four that is um, suffering. How do I know that it's the emerald ash borer and not something else, since all the rest of them are doing really well? Well, we do actually have a diagnostic sheet. It's kind of CSI for um, emerald ash borer um, that I can send you. Um, just real quick, though, um, one of the things you're looking for that are telltale signs of emerald ash borer is if the leaves if it looks like the top of the tree, the top third of the tree is defoliated, um, that's yes. a sign of emerald ash borer. And then um, key to that is if you look at the, look for exit holes, borer exit holes. Yes. They are shaped like a D. So they'll kind like of have D. like a flat top and then, okay. Or, and whereas other borers, they'll, they'll have a round hole, um, but the emerald ash borer has a D shape to it. Okay. Um, so, and there's, and so I can send it, there's pictures along with this guide. So I can send you that. So you can look at the pictures and sort of compare it to what you're seeing on your tree. Okay. And That'd then, be great. Yeah. And then to get a confirmation of that, if you want somebody to, you can actually have a certified arborist come out, cut a piece of that off and, and look for it, look for the galleries um, in the tree. Mm -hmm. um, and you can look for those as well. If you can reach a Part of the damaged tree and look for the galleries of the borer once you peel the bark back. Um, and then you might talk with a certified arborist about whether or not you need to take that down. Um, you will eventually have to take it. Yeah, I know. Eventually, so. We are just trying to decide if, since it's only one, whether to cut it down now and prolong the life of the others, or if it's not emerald ash borer, give it another year, you know. Right. But if it is yeah. emerald ash borer, you'll, you'll want to get it out of there. That's what I thought. So I thought I'd better diagnose it before spring. Great. Okay, so thank you. Ahead, you can go ahead and email me and I can send you that, that um, picture guide for diagnosis. Okay. Will do. Thank you. Super. Any other questions? Okay. If not, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And um, for those of the members of the public joining us, we'll see you next year. Um, yes. We'll start programming again. And to keep a watch out on our Facebook and website for announcements of activities and garden shows and uh, various educational speakers. Thank you. Thank you.